Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Roy Hassan from AWS. Today, we have a webinar combining AWS and AppSolver, talking about frictionless data lake ETL for petabyte scale streaming data. Next slide, please. From an agenda perspective, there'll be a, a few topics that we talk about. A uh, quick introduction, uh, and then we're going to get into uh, some use cases around machine learning and data lakes on AWS. Um, how Iron Source, one of our customers, uses Upsolver uh, to provide to to do analytics on four petabytes of data per month, uh, and then also talk about how Upsolver as a as a solution solves these problems for us. Next step, please. Uh, my name is Roy Hassan. I'm a senior manager for business development at AWS. Um, also on the panel for us today is Ori. Uh, he's the CEO and co-founder of Upsolver. And also Siva, he's the VP of R&D for Iron Source. They'll introduce themselves as the session begins. Next slide, please. So let's talk about what is a data lake. A data lake, if we think about it, is a centralized, curated, and secure repository that allows us to really solve, uh, sorry, store all of our data in a single location without really having to think too much about how do we analyze the data or what do we want to do with it? What questions do we want to ask of that data? So think of it as a place to store all of your data without a lot of pre-planning or processing. Next slide. Why do we want to build a lake? So that's a great question, right? When we have a conversation around building data lakes, it's really important to understand sort of what is the value proposition and why do we want to do it? So the real reason here is we want to be able to break down data silos. Those are the biggest challenges that customers have today. If they want to analyze the data and be able to, to get a holistic view of what their customers are doing and how their business is performing, it's important to bring all the data from all the different corners of the organization into a single location so it's easy for us to analyze that data uh, very quickly and cost effectively. But also, furthermore, we want to be able to use different tools and different analytic capabilities, whether it's machine learning or simple data analytics, to be able to process that data. Doing it all in one place just makes it a lot easier for us to do that. Next slide. So when we talk about data leaks, there's a few components that I wanted to highlight. The first kind of part about this is thinking about it from a business perspective, right? Not so much a technical standpoint, but from a business standpoint. So the first thing that we typically have to do is we have to ingest the data. There's a number of ways to do that. Traditionally, there's batch workloads that we have to move. Let's say take a large table from a database on-premise and move that to, to the cloud. Maybe there's streaming use cases, right? Be able to take mobile device um, data, IoT data, maybe clickstream data. So there's different mechanisms and different tools to move the data. So that's one area that we have to focus on. Another area that we have to focus on is once the data has been moved to the cloud, we need to be able to catalog it. So we actually know what exists. Otherwise, we just have a lot of data scattered all over our data lake, but we don't have a real understanding of what it is. So we catalog that and we expose that through a metadata store so users can explore and really understand what exists. The next step that we want to do after we catalog that, we also want to process it. So typically what we see in large organizations that have a lot of data in silos is that the end user, the data analyst, the data scientist is really forced to take the data and process it and do the, um, the data wrangling sort of on their own every single time because there's really no centralized way to process that data. So we're building a data lake. We want to centralize that uh, process in a way that is easy for us to automate, secure, and also govern. The next aspect that we have to consider is, is storage. There's a number of different ways and, and technologies to store the data, but for a data lake, Remember, we're talking about a lot of data. Maybe some of the data we're not ready to use yet, some of the data we're using already. So we need a way to store the data in a durable fashion, but also make sure that it's cost effective. So we're not paying a lot of money to store all that data before we get insights out of that. And then lastly, once the data has been stored, processed, and cataloged, now we want to be able to bring different compute engines to process that data, whether it's for reporting, BI use cases, and even machine learning. And all of that has to be contained in a secure, governed, and auditable fashion so we can actually control that data and make sure there's no leakage or anything like that. And if the auditors come around and say, you know, what data do you have? How are you using it? We have a, a, a track and we have a way to kind of audit that, that system. Next slide. 
Okay, so from a reference architecture perspective, again, if we look at the previous slide that talked about the ingestion, the, the processing and cataloging, the storage and the compute, we sort of break it down and we, we take it a step deeper. And we say on the left side, we have a bunch of sources, right? There's some streaming sources, there's some data, uh, database sources, data warehouses. Some of it may be on-premise, some of them may be on AWS already. Um, then we want to bring that into the central location, right, the lake. And from AWS perspective, the storage, the durable storage is based on Amazon S3. It's an object store. Think of it as a place to put all of your data without really thinking about what it is and how to use it, but also gives you lifecycle policies that allow you to move the hot data to warm and cold as it transitions as time evolves. So you're saving on storage by moving the data to colder, uh, more cost-effective storage. And then from AWS Lake Formation, that's a service that we introduced um, at reInvent last year and also made GA a couple months ago. And it gives you a way to build governance around your data lake, security and authorization, who can access what tables, when they access it, how often they access it, and what tools they're accessing it from. And then on the right side, we have the data consumption layer. Because we built this data lake, it's a common lake for all of our users. But now we don't want to force them to, to use a particular engine to create a data. We don't want to tell them, hey, data scientists, you can only use a BI tool, right? It's not efficient for them. So we want to be able to open it up and expose, it, expose the lake to any tools, whether it's Amazon Redshift for data warehousing, Amazon Athena for uh, analytics and interactive queries, or whether it's Jupyter Notebooks using SageMaker to be able to process and analyze that data. Next step. So what is Amazon Athena? So we talked about a bunch of different things, and one of the, the compute engines that I mentioned is Amazon Athena. So what really is Athena? So think of Athena as a serverless interactive query engine for data on S3. There's no need to load the data into a database. There's no need to manage any infrastructure or anything like that. You simply submit a SQL query to Athena, and we execute that query behind the scenes on top of data in S3. Optimization for queries tends to happen in two places. In the query itself, how do you write the query in a way that's fully optimized? But also on the data side, what is the best way to store the data, whether it's CSV or it's columnar format like Parquet? Do we add any kind of optimization, sorting, or things like that to the data to improve the performance? And some of the things that Athena is really great at is being able to analyze logs. We see this all the time with our users. They collect a lot of AWS infrastructure logs, maybe server logs, maybe application logs. All the data gets stored in S3 in some structured format, maybe JSON, maybe CSV format, maybe even columnar parquet format. Athena gives you a quick and easy way to dive into those logs without building a lot of infrastructure or any kind of systems around it. So very quickly, just point, create a table on that data, and start running queries. Also, interactive analytics. As that data grows, as more use cases come in, Athena can be exposed to a JDBC and ODBC driver to your favorite BI tool to be able to run analytic queries and build dashboards and reports on top of that. And I'll actually also be able to take that because Athena has a REST API. You can take those, um, those, those OLAP, those analytic queries, and embed them into your application. And this doesn't mean embedding BI widgets into your application. It actually means embedding actual analytical type of queries and capabilities inside of your application. So if a user wants to come to your website and slice and dice the data that you expose to them, Athena is a great tool to integrate into that. Next slide. So when we talk about how do we optimize performance, because Athena is not a database, right? Athena is a distributed query engine, and the data lives in S3. Data, whenever we scan it, gets loaded into memory in the Athena service, and then we execute the query plan on top of that. So the best way to sort of optimize it is, like I said before, at the query side, right? Can we optimize the query? Can we improve the join operations and things like that? But also on the data side. So columnar format is a typical one, right? Be able to take a CSV file format, even though it's compressed, but still convert it to a columnar format that gives us better structure, a binary format, better compression, better access mechanisms, also exposes um, some statistics about the data inside. So when we're interested in only a specific uh, user uh, or user ID inside that file, we can only scan or we can only return the data relevant to that user instead of returning the entire data set. So it reduces how much data we ultimately scan. Partitioning is another way to sort of group similar data together. 
So if you have um, a, a big data set, and let's say the data set is, is product reviews, and some data belongs to book reviews, and some data belongs to video reviews. So if you group those together into two separate groups, when you execute a query that's only interested in the books category, we don't have to scan the video category or other categories, right? So we reduce the amount of data that we scan, therefore improving performance and also reducing cost. Compression comes along with the columnar format. Athena charges you per um, data scan, but on compressed data. So if you compress the data from 100 megabytes to one megabyte, you only pay for the one megabyte of data. So that's really, really important. Compression definitely comes with columnar format um, uh, format like, like Parquet and ORC automatically. Normalization is another aspect, right? So when we take traditional data warehouse queries and we bring them into a distributed query engine like Athena, it's important to sort of think about it from the perspective of how can we sort of normalize that data set instead of, actually it's more like denormalizing the data set. Instead of having complex joins that join multiple tables together, can we pre-process that data set and flatten it out into one single wider table that makes querying it and, and analyzing it much easier. It's also helpful for the analyst and the data scientist because they don't really have to understand the relationships between the tables and how to join them together. Now it's all in one place. So it makes it a lot easier, but also improves the, the performance because the engine doesn't have to do extra work to join that data together. Stream processing is, is another great thing, right? So stream processing is something that is becoming more and more of a reality for a lot of our customers. To be able to, to take continuous data capture um, events from databases and process them in real time, take clickstream data and process it in real time and get real time analytics. So as you're looking at that data in real time, you can start taking action on the data without having to wait for some of the batch process to, to take place. Um, and then upsets, that's something that is becoming more and more um, interesting for customers today. As you build data lakes on AWS, on Amazon S3, Amazon S3 is an object store. So to update individual rows or records inside of a file becomes a bit more difficult, right? You have to get the file, you have to update it in some tool, and then you have to replace the file on S3. So how do we improve that uh, operation altogether? How do we insert and update existing records in files that already exist in S3? Next slide. So ops over. You'll hear a lot more about it. It'll show you how we can help you optimize a lot of these things that we just talked about. So the best practices that, that I explained are great, right? Those things that you can implement on your own, those things that uh, we provide you with, with instructions and guidance and things like that. But AppSolver sort of takes these things and makes them super easy for you. It applies them automatically and it applies them in a continuous manner. So it's not something that you have to keep messing with or keep adjusting. They sort of apply this on the fly automatically. So data can just flow in, all best practices applied, and the user can just query and analyze that data without really having to worry about, is it optimized for best performance? Is it optimized for the best cost? Right, so that's something that, that's really important. And you'll see how it helps you over time manage your data lake as a whole uh, and makes adding more data sets into your data lake much, much easier. So this is it. I'm going to hand it over right now to Seva from uh, IronSource. He's going to take you through um, what they're doing, how they're using AppSolver and Amazon Athena, and some of their use cases. Thank you very much, Roy. So hi, uh, my name is Seva Feldman. Uh, I'm working for IronSource Mobile. Uh, IronSource Mobile is a PNL and IronSource family. Um, you know, basically, we are uh, uh, developing and operating a large in-app uh, video network and uh, mediation and uh, user acquisition platform. Uh, we are uh, 270 employees in total, uh, about 110 people in R&D, uh, all our infrastructure sites in Amazon Web Services. Uh, we are receiving about uh, 1.7 million events a second and holding right now 5.3 petabytes of data warehouse. Uh, our major development languages are Scala, Node.js, and Python for data science. And there is one very important thing you need to know about uh, um, uh, our area, advertisement um, area, is that we are living in a very competitive um, uh, world. and uh, uh, 
we need a days to weeks data product cycle, meaning that we, we are receiving business requirements uh, and then we need to provide uh, um, uh, the value uh, very fast, including the data. So before AppSol, uh, we have a, a pretty known um, um, infrastructure uh, architecture, while uh, we have uh, in um, a team in Aerosource called Iron Beast, which was providing uh, collection and ingestion services for uh, all Iron Source PLs. Uh, it was no cell service, it was a, a data engineering silo. Uh, the cost was pretty high. Uh, and the scale was uh, very problematic. Uh, so uh, if uh, I would ask, uh, for example, for some feature, it would take me weeks to months uh, to get this feature because I'm comp competing with uh, other uh, iron source PLs. Um, so while we started evaluating other alternatives, uh, we keep, kept in mind uh, uh, a few very important uh, uh, criteria for us. Okay, It was uh, obviously cost, uh, it was scalability uh, because of the amount of data we're receiving, uh, and uh, due, by the way, during the evaluation, we, we kind of was in hyper growth in our company, so um, uh, we, we were uh, multiplying uh, users uh, each month. Uh, and uh, it was very important for us to break silos and uh, being very agile in our development cycles. Uh, however, we very like open source, uh, so the first alternative was going to Apache Spark uh, uh, development and creating our own data pipelines. While evaluating that, we understood that uh, it's nice, uh, we like open source, our data science team had uh, uh, great uh, uh, experience with uh, Apache Spark. Uh, we are still using Apache Spark there. Uh, however, it uh, it would take us about uh, half a year to create a stable, uh, robust um, uh, environment for Apache Spark uh, in, uh, in our infrastructure. Um, additionally, to Apache Spark, we evaluated few competitive data warehouse solutions. Uh, and also uh, we evaluated the other uh, ETL, uh, um, basically Israeli uh, located company, uh, which has a, a great deal problem with our scale. Uh, and then uh, we met uh, AppSolver and choose them uh, for following reasons. We looked for a solution, okay, and which were uh, basically implemented uh, while uh, all our data resides in Kafka. Uh, we have many Kafka clusters, uh, many topics. Uh, all our, our uh, development uh, goes through the Kafka, uh, all our messages there. So um, uh, the solution basically right now is connecting AppSolver to our Kafka, starting digesting the data, uh, uh, transforming it, uh, 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 delete some fields, add some fields, calculate some fields, and then push it uh, into the Amazon S3 parquet files, uh, um, Amazon Redshift, uh, uh, and Elasticsearch. And then uh, we can consume uh, this data using Amazon Athena uh, and the Apache Spark um, uh, uh, for uh, further transitions. Um, we're using uh, the data for near real-time analytics uh, of raw data. We are aggregating data in our outputs. Uh, we also using it uh, lastly for uh, uh, GDPR and COPA compliances. Uh, it, it was a great solution for us. Uh, it was um, the GDPR introduced, ju was just introduced and uh, uh, we, we were able to uh, uh, complete it, the project in, one, um, I think in six weeks, um, uh, thanks to AppSolver um, capabilities. Also, we are using um, AppSolver to push uh, um, a business uh, and the infrastructure log uh, for uh, analysis, and uh, we are duplicating uh, data which enters our Amazon Elasticsearch service. Uh, by the way, um, our Elasticsearch cluster is about uh, 55 to 60 terabytes right now. Um, also, just to understand the scale, it's uh, 1.7 million uh, uh, events per second ingress we have uh, 15 table outputs. Uh, what benefits we achieved? Uh, 
fast time to market, day to weeks, eliminating the data engineering silo. As I said before, we had one team for uh, 800 people in Iron Source providing this service. Right now, every and each developer in all my development groups are capable to enter App Solver, uh, create a feature, add, change, or delete um, uh, any field in the data, go to App Solver and change it immediately. So uh, basically, uh, um, uh, my product, my BI, uh, my operation uh, uh, folks are capable to receive the feature very fast, uh, as there is no silo. Um, we saved thousands of uh, big data engineering uh, hours. Uh, we increased our scale uh, almost 20 times uh, in a year and a half. Because it's so easy with, um, uh, to create the data pipelines and play with it and exercise with it and uh, simulate um, uh, simulate changes uh, and so on. Uh, through that, we received also significant cost reduction as previous data warehouse solution was uh, pretty costly. Uh, which top so uh, top pay absolute feature we uh, we got. Um, it's very important uh, to have a scale in such hyper growth uh, environment. Uh, we're capable to scale. Uh, I believe in two years we never uh, got any scale problems with AppSolver whatsoever. Um, uh, AppSolver, in our case, uses the same uh, technologies we are using, so it, it was uh, very easy uh, to uh, integrate them. Uh, visual service uh, transformation, aggregation, deduplication. Um, you know, think about it that you don't need uh, you can you can uh, code through the UI okay so you can create a transformation you can aggregate and deduplicate data and you can see it in real time uh, reflecting in your uh, um, in your data lake uh, you can create testing uh, uh, testing table you can test uh, data from the, the same Kafka topic uh, your production is working and you see that immediately. Uh, Athena connector. So uh, we started using uh, AppSolver uh, while we uh, used only Redshift, and then uh, we introduced Athena um, uh, using AppSolver. Um, so uh, for us, compaction custom partitioning was a huge, um, a huge deal. Uh, sometimes we are pushing data lately. Uh, sometimes it's uh, just minutes uh, or hours. Sometimes it's days. So compacting data was a must feature for us, and uh, we got it using AppSolver. Um, and as uh, VP r and and managing of DevOps, uh, I'm, you know, I know that uh, some of you understand the, the headache uh, of compliance and security. Introducing new data pipeline technology into your environment uh, can be pretty scary and frustrating because you need to work with your legal and with your IT and so on. and, and uh, um, you, it may take months until you will capable to start uh, POCs. Uh, in our case, AppSolver deployed in our VPC, so there is no data out. Uh, AppSolver is not touching our data or any other company touching our data. In, uh, uh, and it, it made our process super easy. And we got uh, basically um, uh, approval from IT and uh, legal, I believe, after one week of, um, uh, of testing. Uh, Ori uh, from Absol will take it from here uh, and uh, um, explain about the features of the product. Thank you very much, Seva. Uh, so my name is Ori. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Absolver. Uh, I'm an ex-DBA uh, and head of data integration platform. And today I want to tell you why we decided to build Absolver. Also, although Seva gave a very good uh, intro to why we built Absolver. And I want to show you a demo of how the product actually works. So first, AppSolver is an advanced technology partner for AWS with a data and analytics competency. Uh, you can use the product by just going through the AWS marketplace and opening a free trial. And all the billing that comes after that is, will be a part of your AWS bill. And the AppSolver solution will also validate it technically by AWS as part of the well-architected program and also as part of the competency program. So 
as Roy Hasson uh, said in his in his slides, everyone wants to use the data lake because of the the advantage for storing data. It's very low cost, it's very reliable, and you can store data which is also unstructured or semi-structured, uh, which you can't really do with databases, and that's really necessary for an initiative like machine learning. The challenge usually starts when you actually want to use the data, and then you no longer have all the comfort that you used to have when you worked with a database. So there isn't, there are no schemas, there is no SQL, uh, no out-of-the-box performance optimization, and you need to know all of the best practices, just like Roy Hasson described, and you need to spend a lot of time on doing data ops. So the process of data like ETL which is the topic of our session today, is moving data from the left side of the diagram to the right side of the diagram. Uh, doing it today requires a variety of tools. And it doesn't really matter if you're using open source or you're using AWS. You would need to use several tools to implement data like ETL. For example, let's say you would uh, write an ETL job using Spark then you would orchestrate those, uh, those ETL jobs with uh, a platform like Apache Airflow or Apache NiFi. And if you want to do operations like joins and aggregation, you would also, also need to manage the, the state of your ETL. So you would actually need to spin up an additional database like Cassandra or like Redis and use them to, uh, use them to implement those joins. The, the result of what you're seeing here is that you kind of need the, you kind of need data engineering for everything. That's how you're creating a data engineering silo, and that's the reason data lakes are often notorious for being very very long. So the projects take quite a long time to do, and there is no self service. So the data consumers who understand how to manipulate the data don't get that direct access like they had in the with databases. This this challenge, this pain is the reason that we created Absolver. And the mission is one platform that takes you from the left side of this diagram, from streaming data, from data lakes, into the right side, where you're actually consuming the data and getting the business value that you, that you want. Absolver's approach to data lake ETL is streaming. So the data is going to be delivered using streaming. Every event is going to be processed separately, but you will also be able to use all your historical data. So AppSolver transformations are fully stateful, and you can use AppSolver indexing engine, which is baked into the platform, to connect your historical, your historical data. It was also very important for both, uh, for both customers in AWS that AppSolver would not create a lock-in for the customers. So they will be able to use the same kind of tools that Rui Hassan described in his part of the presentation. That's why AppSolver is storing all its raw data, index data, parquet data, everything is stored on S3. All the metadata is stored in, in, in an open metadata store like Glue Data Catalog or Apache Hive Meta Store. And the code that you're generating with AppSolver is actually SQL. So you can take that SQL, push it to a Git repository, and continue to do CI CD just like you're doing today. There are a few benefits that let's say that, that are that are common to AppSolver customers. In many cases, we see what Seva described in Iron Source, where companies want to get self-service access to the data, and AppSolver takes away about 95% of the effort comparing to Apache Spark pipelines, just because you're using the, the SQL you already know, or use a visual interface instead of integrating multiple infrastructures together. The second thing is that you can connect the different silos in your lake, the streaming data, the lake, so all sources of data can be joined in AppSolver as part of the ETL and delivered to the consumption layer in real time. The last part, and I think one of AppSolver's best partnerships is the partnership with Athena. AppSolver has a deep integration into Athena, and by running Athena on an AppSolver-generated uh, file system on S3, your queries can run 100 times faster comparing to just uh, storing uh, uh, the raw data as is on S3. AppSolver also adds capabilities to Athena, and that will be part of the demo. Uh, for example, the ability to update or delete tables by, by key. 
All of those uh, benefits that I just described are made possible with the indexing technology that absorbs ability to so the ability uh, uh, to, to create an index on top of the data lake kind of closes the gap between the functionality you would get from a database and the functionality you would get from a data lake. At, at this point, we finished the, 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 fir the first slides. I think now we are ready for the demo and actually see how the product works. <laughs> and uh, the scenario we chose for this, uh, for this webinar is click prediction. So in this case, we have three sources of data. One of them is the impressions, the ad impression, people, people clicking on ads that's coming from Apache Kafka. There, some of those people actually click on the ads that they see. So that stream is coming from Apache Kinesis. And we also have a, a bunch of historical data on S3. And that historical data is very important for us to be able to predict if a user is going to click. <laughs> so we want to create a data set with those three pieces of, uh, of data, impression, user data, and click, and query that data set from Amazon Athena. Since at App Solver is integrated with the Glue data catalog, you could also use Redshift Spectrum, you can use your own version of Apache Presto, but I think Athena became very, very popular today. We see it in a lot of our customers, so we decided to use that for our, for our demo. So at this point, I'm, I'm switching to the App Solver user interface. And if you would connect to App Solver through the AWS Marketplace, this would be the user interface that you, you will see. And here you can see a list of connectors. So I could bring data from S3, from Kinesis, from Kafka. And let's see, let's just see uh, what, what does it mean to, to use a connector. So for example, for Kinesis, I just choose a region, I choose a stream. And once I click on continue, a data source would be created in App Solver. So what, what's, what's actually a data source? So a data source, and this is a list of data sources <laughs> that I have in my, uh, in my environment, in my demo environment, uh, a data source is a, visualis a visualization of your data. So if I'm clicking on impressions, for example, App Solver automatically generated the schema. So this is on the left, you can see that this data set has four fields, the timestamp, the impression ID, the user ID, and the campaign ID. And for each field uh, in the, for example, this campaign ID, I can also see more statistics to understand what's actually in my raw data. So that would be for the first stage of raw data exploration. This campaign ID appears in 100% of the events. It, there are 13 distinct campaigns in the data. And this value is the most common with 51.81%. The nice thing here is the, the nice thing here is that I can actually go and zoom in on a specific range of time, and then all the statistics would be re, would be updated for that time frame. So right now I can see I can see that there are only eleven campaigns in this uh, in this range. So that would be the first first step. Now I have my. Uh, my, my data source, and I want to create an ETL. I want to send the data to Athena. So I'm going to click on this button here on the top right called Add Output. <laughs> and once I do, I have a list of output connectors that I can send the, uh, the data to. I'm going to choose Amazon Athena. I'm going to name it. And I, I, I got to a page that lets me map my raw data from the data source to the Athena table. So let's see, let's just add a few columns to, to you know, see how exactly it's done. So I can choose, for example, those four fields we had in the impressions, select them, <coughs> and those were now added. So data.campaignID would be mapped to a campaign ID uh, column within Athena. I'm going to click on preview. And this is the table that's actually going to we'll create in Athena. You can see it before actually running the, the, the ETL. But if I'm going to click here on run, I'm going to, we're already going to finish the entire, uh, the entire process. So I think like if I'm think, thinking of placing myself in the place of the user, the first thing they're going to ask, what kind of data transformation can I do in App Solver? And you have two ways to, to run your data transformation. One is by using the user interface that has a lot of baked in functions that uh, you can use. The other option is to use SQL. 
and I, I clicked here on this SQL button and you see that for the user in for the mapping that I did with the form view now I have an SQL command and if I'm going to run that SQL command I'm pretty much I can work with the SQL experience and I can work with the visual experience and go back back and forth between them and each change will be applied to to the other right now what I want to do is paste a SQL that I prepared before this demo and this SQL implements the use case of joining the impressions with the clicks with the historical user data so since there are 25 lines here let's let's try to break it down into pieces the first piece reading from here is that i'm just doing a select on top of the impressions data so the impression stream coming from kinesis is my main source and what i'm doing is i'm going to enrich that source by doing a left outer join once with something called click data and then with another view called user data so where did I get this click data and user data? How did I uh, add them into my uh, into my query? I declare them here using a with syntax, which is very common to do with SQL. And click data is defined as the mapping between the impression ID and the last time there was a click. And for the user data, I can map the, the user ID to features like the number of times the user clicked the data in the last 90 days, the last time there was a click, the last device, uh, uh, the last device ID. But the cool part here is that AppSolver is actually maintaining a window. And I, that's how I can bring the last 90 days of user data. I could change that to, one, uh, to 180 days. And basically I could use any time range, time range to bring historical user data. The reason that syntax, that operation works in AppSolver is that behind the scenes, every time you write this syntax, AppSolver automatically creates an index. And when you are doing this left outer join here on the bottom, you are joining with the index and you're not joining with the actual data on S3. And that's how those joins can work in a very high uh, uh, high performance and with let's say a billion keys for a join would not be an, a performance issue in in absolver so i hope that part made sense so any transformation in sql can be done in absolver uh, any that transformation would also be applied to the visual interface so any stateful transformation here would would work and now I actually go i want to go ahead and run it and see the data in athena so i clicked on run I'm going to choose the bucket I want to send the store the data on. AppSolver is integrated with my Athena account. So I'm going to create a table called webinar table. And I'm going to click on deploy. So the, the one thing I couldn't really demo is what's happening now behind the scenes. So I'm going back to the deck and explaining the process currently running in the background. So what AppSolver uh, ETL is doing actually has two steps. <clears throat> the first step is reading the raw data, applying all the transformation that you just uh, uh, that we just uh, uh, added in, and creating small parquet files on Amazon S3, and creating the table structure in the Glue data catalog. Once this phase is complete, it's already possible to use the uh, to use Athena to query that data set. And the data would be here very fast because this is streaming ETL. The challenge here, and that's a unique challenge to data like ETL, is that you need to optimize the file system. And Roy mentioned some of the best practices that you need to follow. One of the most important best practices is the size of the files that you came on S3. The performance you're going to get with small size, small files of, uh, of Parquet will be completely different if you're going to create bigger files that are more optimized for engines like Athena. So AppSolver has another process called compaction, and that process takes those small files, it combines them together, it applies some more best practices that I didn't mention here, and that's way the data in the table keeps being optimized to improve performance. Every time you're creating up more optimized files, you also need to tell Glue, because when Athena is querying the data, it's actually asking Glue, where are my files? Which files should I read? Should I read the small files or should I read the bigger files? So AppSolver automatically does that, uh, that sync uh, with Glue. 
I'm going back to to App Server. Here, there is let's say if if you would want to drill down in what's happening behind your ETL. So these are the streams that were created, the impressions and the clicks that we did not created, the stream that we are reading from. Those are the indexes that App Server implicitly creates to in order to do the join. And in the end, there is the output into Athena. If I'm going to move into Athena right now, you'll notice that there isn't a table called webinar table. I'm going to refresh my view in Athena. And right now there is a new table called webinar TBL and it has the exact same columns that we defined in, in our SQL. If I'm going to preview that table, in a second, you'll see that data is already has already been populated into the into the table. I think my oh, there there we go. My console got stuck there for a second. So you can see that the query took 2.71. And we just retrieve the first 10 columns of that data set. And now I can start querying on that data set and understand if the features that I prepared for machine learning make any make any sense. Switching back to the to the deck, there is one more part I want to explain. So so far we covered App Solver regular ETL into Athena, including joins, including joins and aggregations. The other very common use case we see with Athena today is updates and deletes. So if you want to replicate an on-premise database into Amazon Athena, if you want to enforce compliance in Athena, you want to be able to do updates and deletes. And in this case, you're seeing an SQL that's sending data to Athena, but you sometimes, let's say, in, sometimes I'm going to see a new visitor ID. So in this case, I'm looking at visitors data. If I'm going to see a new visitor ID, I'm going to do an insert into Athena. But if I'm going to, if I've already seen that visitor ID in the past, uh, then I'm going to update Athena. So in this case, we are counting, sorry, we are counting the number of pages seen in Athena so far, the total number of bounces, the total number of cities that user visited from, and the way App Solver does this behind the scene is again the same co uh, concept of streaming ETL and then compaction. But in this case, compaction is not only uh, creating bigger files from smaller files, it's actually applying those updates and deletes to your historical data. So the table that you have in Athena only contains data per key and not the entire original raw data. So querying that table can work much faster. Uh, just to show you exactly what I mean by saying much faster, I pre-created that table. So you can see here that I have a table called webinar TBL updates, and I have the visitor, the count, and I'm going to increase, uh, I'm going to zoom in. So the full visitor ID, the count number of pages, the bounces, the cities. So all that is in my table. And when I go ahead and actually query that table, I'm doing a select star. So I'm I want to query all the data, all the columns in the table, and I and I run it. What I see is that the query took only 3.93 seconds, and I only scanned 95, 29 kilobytes of data. So I didn't need to query the entire data. I just queried data by key, and that's the kind of the proof that AppSolver rewrites the data, so you wouldn't need to scan all of it again and again. That's pretty much the end of uh, of our demo. We finished both the dataset example and the updates and deletes example. And what I what I want to answer is one very common question we get. So, how when should I use App Solver and when should I use Spark? Uh, when when is one better than the other? And I think that Spark does a very good job today. Uh, for data engineering departments, but Spark is not simple. You need to know the ins and outs of Spark, just like you need to know the ins and outs of Hadoop in order to do data like ETL with Spark. But with App Solver, you don't need to know all that. You can just use the SQL, uh, you can use the user interface. A data analyst would not use Spark, but would use uh, a App Solver to create their data. It would be a simpler experience. On top of that, AppSolver has that indexing engine baked into the platform. 
So doing joins or doing updates and deletes can work uh, can work very fast, and you wouldn't need any additional infrastructure in order to do it. You also don't need to know all the best practices. So the the query performance you're going to get from Athena using AppSolver is going to be the best that you can can get, just because we are applying all the best practices that AWS recommends. With Spark-based ETLs, you would need to implement those best practices on your own. And the last difference is that with AppSolver, everything is streaming. So you're always going to get a fresh copy of the data. With Spark, you will need to implement Scrape and Batch in a separate kind of way. So those are the key topics to compare both the platforms. And actually, most of AppSolver customers, they're using both AppSolver and Apache Spark. So the two platforms can live side by side. And from here, we're going to move to the Q&A section and see what kind of questions you might have. Great. Thank you, Ori. Um, my name is Igor Alexiev. I'm a partner solution architect at AWS in data and analytics uh, team. And I'll be helping out today with the questions. So once again, Seva, Roy, or Ori, great presentation. And everybody, if you can uh, post your questions into the question window, it would be great. And I already see some questions coming in. So first question, I think it's for Ori. How is AppSolver priced? So AppSolver uh, has a compute-based model, so you pay per uh, per hour, uh, just like you would with EC2. So basically, there is a markup on top of the EC2 price that you would pay. Uh, un under the hood, AppSolver is using spot instances, EC2 spot instances. So you pay for the price of the spot instance, and you pay for the AppSolver software. And of course, you only pay for what you actually use. So the platform includes auto-scaling. Uh, you can actually see the pricing uh, in the AWS marketplace. Great, thank you, Ori. And I think next question is for you again. Um, can we use other databases than, uh, than Amazon on AWS? Can we use other databases than Amazon? So I'm not sure if you're meaning if the intention is input databases or output databases. So if you want to bring in input databases, at the moment we are doing it with, by adding DMS, AWS Data Migration Service, and AppSolver can read the inputs generated by DMS and create tables in Athena. And there are also several databases. Some of them are Amazon, some of them are not Amazon, that you can send the data to. Uh, as part of your ETL. Great, so it means basically what database is supported by DMS will be supported by AppSolver. Right? Exactly, exactly. Uh, awesome, uh, next question. How is it possible to try AppSolver? So if you go to the AWS Marketplace, you can start a free trial. That's a 14 days trial. And during that trial, uh, you get a lot of service from us. So we train you on AppSolver. We help you think about your use cases and how it's best to implement them. And we make sure that you're getting into something that works on a production scale. And then you decide whether or not you also want to buy the platform. Great, thank you. Uh, next question, I think it's still for you, Ori. I understand that using Athena and the standard SQL, we can query S3 and data sources. How would I know which metadata and model to query? So when you're writing the the, the ETL, so I'm actually going to switch back to this view and write on click on SQL. So over here, I'm selecting several columns. The left side is my source field, and the right side would be the tape, the column in Athena. So in this case, I'm going to have column win time, impression ID. So by adjusting the SQL that you write, you're, you're controlling the, the schema that you're going to create in Athena. And if I'm going to switch to the form view, you on the side, you can also look at the data types. And that's, that's basically it. Great. Thank you. Next question. Is for your again, is it possible to add AppSolver to AWS billing? Yes, definitely. So when you're doing, uh, you're buying AppSolver from the marketplace, you're buying, uh, you're actually adding AppSolver to your AWS bill. You can pay for AppSolver on demand. You can do reserved models. You can ask us for private offers. Uh, you can pay on a monthly basis, on a yearly basis. You kind of have all the options you have on AWS through AppSolver through the marketplace. Great, thank you. Uh, next question, how is the ETL handled? Which component 
And a follow-up question to that, where does the ETL comes into the data lake? Is it before storing to data lake or after storing into data lake? So it's actually both. So when App Server connects to, let's say, Kafka, it, it serializes all the data from Kafka into an S3 bucket. And then every operation that you're doing is back to S3. Even if we are loading to Redshift, we are first writing the data to S3. By creating an architecture that transforms data from one S3 folder to another S3 folder, we can there guarantee exactly once processing, which means you'll never get duplicate data and you'll never get missing data by running an app over ETL. Great, thank you. Uh, next question for you, Ori, again. What kind of customer data does Absolver store? So AppSolver the, doesn't store any customer data. So the way it works is AppSolver stores all the data on S3. That bucket uh, on S3 is in within the customer account. So let's say you you, you deployed AppSolver into your account, an AppSolver employee doesn't even have access to the data that you have on S3. The only data sent to the App Server cloud is billing information and monitoring information since we are supporting your uh, deployment remotely. But we don't get any pieces of data uh, into the App Server cloud. And that was very important for Seva, for example, in Iron Source, uh, when he went to approve App Server with the security and legal, uh, uh, with the person in charge of the security and legal. Yeah, this, so this is great for achieving all kind of compliances with when handling PCI and PI, right? Exactly. It's like, it's AppSolver is like on-premise, but on cloud. Great. <laughs> um, um, I think next question you already answered, but um, um, so how is the data integration achieved? What data integration tool is used to do this? You already mentioned uh, data migration service. I don't know if you want to add anything here. So I think they're asked to the question is like our app solver is doing the data processing. The way app solver can process data at scale like Seva from Ironsource mentioned is by uh, writing the entire platform on Scala and to do a fully decoupled architecture. So all the processing is do done on, S on EC2, not using any local storage and all the data storage is done on S3. And that's how you can really scale uh, scale the platform and of course if the, the intention was what kind of data integration does app server has so for example dms is, in, is, is such an integration and we have some uh, out of the box connectors like kafka kinesis data lakes and those kind of things great uh, next question what's included in AppSolver's connector to athena so first of all the the fact that you can get the data in there in with using streaming uh, the second is that you have compaction. So all the best practices, really all the best practices that Roy Hasson mentioned in the beginning in his slide are already built into the platform and the ability to do deletes and updates. So as Roy said, Athena is a, a SQL engine. It's not a database. You can do insert, update and delete, but customers do want to do updates and deletes. So app servers add that functionality in the ETL layer. Great, thank you. And you just mentioned uh, before Kinesis, so you have a question about Kinesis. Um, can you join uh, multiple Kinesis streams? Absolutely. So you can join any data. So everything becomes a data source in AppSolver. You can you can join any two data sources together. So Kinesis and Kafka, Kinesis and Kinesis, Kinesis and S3, uh, S3 and S3. So any combination would work. Great, thank you. And next question, can you can Absolver work with Redshift Spectrum or Spark over EMR? Those are actually two tools, but yes. So you can, since Absolver puts all the metadata in the Glue data catalog, actually once you create a table in Athena, it's already automatically created in Redshift Spectrum and the same idea goes for uh, Presto over EMR. Great. So basically, because you support S3 and Glue Catalog, through those two services, you support Spectrum and uh, Redshift and AMR, right? Exactly. Uh, in Iron Source, by the way, they're using the <laughs> same copy of the data and they're querying the data with Athena, with Spectrum, and with Spark, using one copy of the data using Glue uh, as the metadata store. Great. And uh, speaking of Spark, how is Absolver different from Databricks? 
So Databricks is a Spark, uh, a Spark, a Spark platform. So Databricks, you would use a data engineer would be able to use Databricks to implement an ETL. But once you want to go to a person that doesn't know all the ins and outs of Spark, you could not use Databricks. It's not a, it would not be a simple platform. Uh, that's at least on the ease of use side of things. Other than that, AppServer also has the indexing uh, engine built in. So I would say AppServer can join multiple sources of data like Kinesis and Kinesis, the question we had before, at a scale which is about 10 to 15 times larger than Databricks. Um, maybe I'm going too, too deep here, but the indexing technology that AppServer built is, uh, is breakthrough technology when it comes to compression and AppServer can keep compress data in memory and use it for join while every other um, every other vendor that we know is, uh, also databricks needs to keep the uncompressed data in memory so the uh, app server can keep 10 to 15 more more uh, bigger states in memory great and actually there's a question about indexes and how um, app server handles the data does app server download the download the data and then it works on it locally um, where is it creating dynamic indexes? So those indexes are actually stored again back to S3. So you don't need to store anything locally. Those the indexes are are, uh, are stored on S3, and then they are loaded into memory uh, when you are actually running the ETL. The fact that those indexes are so compressed mean that you can just keep a lot of them in memory when you are doing the ETL. So you read from S3, process in memory, and then write back to S3. Yes, right. exactly. Excellent. Um, next question, can you share the comparative analysis? I think it's going to be part of the presentation, right? Yes, exactly. And uh, next question, what is the recommendation, your recommendation for the hybrid environment? What do you mean by hybrid environment? So I presume um, the person means uh, a mixture on on-prem and uh, cloud. So AppServer's connectors to connect to Kafka and to HDFS let you put, uh, ingest data from on-premise into the cloud. So if I would connect to an HDFS folder on-premise or to a Kafka topic, I would bring the data from that folder into the cloud. And there is actually a public case study uh, describing a customer that did that on the AWS Big Data blog. Uh, if your source is not Kafka or HDFS, we will probably ask you to to ingest the data on your own to S3, and AppServer would pick it up from there. Great, yeah. And then with AWS, typically, it, you know, ingesting data into S3 is not expensive. It's when taken out. So that's something to remember. Exactly. All right. Uh, I think next question is actually for Seva. What is the total size of the data that you had in the presentation in your use case? Uh, 5.3 petabytes, uh, while uh, we're receiving about 4 petabytes uh, a month. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Seva. And I think uh, I think we handled this question already. How do I get started with AppSolver? I think you already answered that, right? Yes, yes. Um, through through AWS marketplace, marketplace, right? Exactly. Yep. All right. And uh, next question is, I think it's for Ori. How do I get, sorry, what is the difference between AWS Glue and AppSolver? Uh, I think that the, the comparison is again regarding so glue would be serverless spark so if I would want to implement my uh, ETLs using spark I would use glue uh, and if I want uh, like a visual self-service kind of way to do it I would probably use an, an app solver. So app solver mm -hmm. would provide an easier experience but it would not be spark based like glue. Great thank you and then um, next question I think it's still for Ori. Can you talk about the data retention on your streaming pipelines? Yes, definitely. So every object in AppSolver, whether it's a data source or an output like the ones we created, you can go to properties and define retention, and then AppSolver would automatically delete data uh, after that retention. The nice thing about giving AppSolver the ability to manage retention is that it can actually delete file. It can make sure that it's okay to delete file and there isn't some kind of ETL job which is dependent on that file. So it kind of, it would be a smarter deletion process comparing to just delete the entire folder by, by date. Great, thank you. And I think the next question was about AppSolver and S3 comparing to Databricks and Delta Lake on S3. 
Yeah, so in the context of data lake, so both Delta Lake and the update and delete solution in AppSolver I showed today try to add updates and deletes into the into the lake. I think the difference is that the Delta Lake is a new database API on top of the lake. So for Data Lake, you can do insert, update, and delete, and then query Delta. Uh, but then you would need to integrate Athena into, into Delta, and you would need to change your ingest ingestion to do insert, update, and delete, and it kind of creates a lock-in, just like just like a data warehouse. So I would compare Data Lake to a kind of a data warehouse solution, although the data is stored on a Data Lake. With AppSolver, uh, you don't need to make any of those changes, and since we are only doing manipulations in Glue, we're not creating any custom process, uh, then you can query the data from Athena, from Spectrum. You don't need any special uh, AppSolver Athena integration for that. I think that when Roy mentioned the benefits of AppSolver in his presentation, he talked about data lake hygiene and about AppSolver keeping uh, the, the rules, the best practices of what's creating a locking and what's not creating a locking. The AppSolver solution doesn't create a locking for updates and deletes. Great, thank you. And next question for Ori again. How how is how do you handle data privacy issues for HIPAA, GDPR, etc. with uh, data masking and encryption? So so the 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 best answer uh, I have is that AppServer is like on premise on cloud. So uh, on premise is considered HIPAA compliant. So AppServer employees would not have access to the data. So in such a case for a customer that needs HIPAA compliance, AppServer would be deployed within their cloud account. Uh, so no data could leave that, that account. You could also implement uh, things like masking as part of your ETL. Uh, that's a different, a different uh, uh, part of, that, of the same question. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is for Ari again. How is missing data handled? Uh, for example, how does AppSolver determine if uh, if missing is random? So the the take the first part, which you you have to try to believe it, is there is no missing data. So since AppSolver's architecture architecture is S3 to S3, we are guaranteeing exactly once, and you wouldn't get duplicate or missing. Or missing data with your uh, with your ETL, you can always go and check both sides. So query the number of events in Kafka, and on the other side try to use, for example, we once used Athena to make sure to, to prove that data uh, flowed in in in, it, in a complete way into Athena. But it's not a problem we see with customers. Data is complete. Great, thank you. Um, next question, can CloudWatch data be fed to Athena? What kind of compression is done before being able to feed the data to Athena and as its pricing depends, depends on the size of ingested data? So right now, AppServer doesn't have a connector to bring the CloudWatch data into Athena. You could do it manually by dumping the data on S3. Um, so, and pricing is not really affected, at least from the app server side, since you are paying per compute. So it's really uh, kind of the volume of uh, the volume of data. Uh, one thing that I didn't say before, and maybe is important to say, is that AppSolver sends all monitoring metrics to CloudWatch. So CloudWatch is one of AppSolver targets, but I see that this question is in the context of an input to AppSolver. Great, and I think we're running out of time, so this is going to be the last question. Does AppSolver support uh, batch loads or only streaming? So AppSolver, so it supports batch loads, but the way it works is that it's it's doing the implementation in streaming. So, for example, Seva said that they have aggregated outputs. So, for example, you want to output data once an hour and then query the aggregated data to reduce cost and 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 query latency. So, AppSolver can do batch operation, but under the hood, it's using streaming. It's processing any of every event at a time and using indexing to to join with the historical data. Great, thank you very much, Ori and Seva and Roy. I think at this point, we're gonna conclude the webinar. If you have uh, any uh, next steps, you've seen the previous slides, you can uh, take down those links. Uh, the deck will be shared with you. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye.